much for joining us. You're welcome. And we'll uh, get going. Well, my name is Frank DeMauro. And I'm a 100% Sicilian. My mother and father came to this country shortly after the turn of the 19th century. And they ended up in Omaha, where they met and married. We lived in Little Italy, like every town had a Little Italy. And at the age of two, we moved from Little Italy to a different part of the town. Over the years, we lived nice, had a nice neighborhood, good people. And I went through school, and I graduated in June of 1942. Well, the war has already been on for a year or so, but uh, well, as long as you were in high school or school, they didn't uh, bother you. The Army left you alone. But my brother, he's got something here written here about my older brother. As soon as the war started, he immediately joined the Navy. And he was in the Pacific, and there's an article there in the, in the newsletter there about his adventure in the Navy. So in uh, February of 43, Uncle Sam said to me, I want you. So I was invited to join the Army. And I was sent to Fort Belvoir, Virginia, and trained as a combat engineer. After my training, I was sent overseas, but I didn't go over as a unit. I went all alone. I, I don't know why. I just, they sent this all over the place. So I landed in Casablanca, North Africa, in uh, June of 42, uh, 43, I mean. And uh, was there four months, spent four months in North Africa in a repo depot, they call that a, it's a place where uh, uh, you sit there and wait for whenever you're needed, they call your name and you would fill in different units or that lost men, but uh, they never called me. Four months I'd laid there. <laughs> And I used, to involve, I used to volunteer for anything because the only thing you did there was lay there, sit there, do nothing in a pup tent. And so I used to volunteer for anything that came up, you know. So one day they wanted uh, about 10 guys. And what had happened, a, volunteer, uh, a, a saboteur had given himself up and they wanted us men they gave us rifles, and we had this volunteer, uh, uh, this, this saboteur. This was a German? German saboteur, and uh, we had an interpreter with us. So there was 10 of us guys, and we got a truck, and we all got in this truck. And we went and, uh, up in the, in the hills of North Africa, and we followed this man, and he showed us where he was at, and he went, the reason we went up there he had uh, time bombs that he brought with him when he landed by submarine, and he had hidden them up in the hills there. So he picked them up, strapped them on his back, and on we went. And uh, the day finished up that we stopped for lunch at an outfit over there. When it's time to eat, you see a chow line, you just get in line. It didn't make no difference where, who the outfit was, or you just get in line. But anyway, we got back, and as soon as I got back in my outfit, <laughs> the guys jumped and said, hey, they called your name. Four months, they called my name. So I run down the company headquarters, got the sergeant, and I says, hey, where am I going? Where am I going? He, says, he looked at his list, and he says, well, he says, you weren't there, so you just crossed you out. You just have to wait till the next time they call you. <laughs> I said, oh, no. So I don't know why I did it. But I took down the I went down the road about a half a mile of depot headquarters, and I didn't know what I was doing. I just went into this tent, and I says, 
what happened to me, and there was a sergeant there, and he says, I can't do nothing for you. Go see the lieutenant in the other tent. So I go over there, and I tell him the story, the same story, you know. I wasn't there, and, and, I, and, uh, and I said, damn it, I'm tired of laying around doing nothing. He says, you really, truly mean that? I said, yes, sir. I'm so goddamn tired of laying around doing nothing. I'll do anything. He says, you be here in the morning with your gear. I'll get you out. So the next morning I got there and we're waiting. Here comes a Jeep. But those are a couple other guys with me. See, what they do, we were getting ready, of course, uh, to the landing of Italy. So a company, if they're not completely manned, they had to fill their quota. They had to have a certain number of men, you know, each outfit had a quota. Anyway, we were just filling in. So we went inside, got to this, in this Jeep, and I said, well, where are we going? He says, well, this is headquarters, 188th Ordnance Battalion. So here I am, a combat engineer going into ordnance. And not only that, headquarters, battalion headquarters. So, he, you know, he didn't do nothing. We didn't carry guns. We didn't even have any guns. We were rear echelon. We always sort of, we came up and followed. So we laid, we shortly after I joined the outfit, while I was in North Africa, the Sicilian campaign, I know it lasted, I think, not even hardly 30 days, when they went right through Sicily. And then we were getting ready to hit Italy. So I finally got my outfit. We were all ready. We got on LSTs, these big boats that opened up in front, you know. The, and uh, we landed at Salerno. And uh, so the ship was unloading and I was in there and uh, sitting there waiting for my outfit to come by because we was on top deck. So while I'm standing there, the sailors there that they were running the ship, they gave us push brooms. Three or four of us guys, he says, sweep the deck out. So I'm sweeping the deck out and everybody's leaving, leaving the boat, you know. They're all landing and all of a sudden I'm looking around, my outfit's gone. And there was one boat, one up, uh, last truck going out. I just dropped the broom and jumped in the back of the truck. And as the truck got out of the ship and started up the bank, the engine conked out. So here I am, my outfit's gone. I'm all alone, so I just start walking. <laughs> so what do you do there, you know, at lunchtime, whenever? I got to say, you see a chow line, just get in line. So anyhow, I start looking for my outfit. So I spent the first day... Uh, Afternoon and evening, couldn't find them, so I, the evening, I just found a truck and laid in a truck and went to bed. It made no difference where you laid over there. And uh, the next morning, I took off again, and I did find my outfit. So we sat there, and one particular thing that happened while we were bivouacked there, we had a, of course, I was in battalion headquarters, so we had a dental outfit with us, a dentist. We also had a doctor, and... Uh, the reason we had these with us, because every morning they'd have sick call, and our companies that were in our battalion, if they needed anything, dental work or doctor, they, every morning we had sick call, and they'd come to headquarters. That's why we had the doctors there. So while we're, sit, while we're there in this first area, a uh, woman come around with her friends, and she was pregnant. It looked like she was ready to pop. So... Anyway, our doctor said, he volunteered, he says, when the baby comes, if you need help, let me know, and I'll come and help you out. So, I went with him, and of course, I spoke Italian. I was the only guy in the outfit that spoke Italian. So whenever something happened, they'd call me. So anyhow, the doctor and I, we agreed we'd be come over there and help with the baby delivery. So what happened, about 3 or 4 in the morning, I'm sleeping, here comes this kid, he's beating on me, he wakes me up, and he's telling me the baby's coming. Well, I didn't understand what he was talking about, I was half asleep. I says, oh, it's too early yet, we can't wake up the doctor, I'll call him later. So he left, and finally we got up and going, we got down to the house, of course the baby already was delivered. So I missed out on delivering a baby. So, we moved on up. And we're heading for Naples. We went by Naples and we bivouacked right above Naples. 
And of course, if you look to your left from Naples, is Mount Vesuvius. And beautiful to look at. And uh, I have to say, while we were there, Mount Vesuvius erupted. And we were right close to it. It's the most beautiful thing to see at night. The flames would shoot up in the air and big lightning flashes from static electricity would flash above, you know. And it was something beautiful to see. We had we sat there, and we were just north of Naples there, and one day we're sitting there, and all of a sudden we hear this, whoa, whoa, whoa something going over, you know. <laughs> German artillery going over our head. What are we doing up so close? Back, we moved back 10 miles back. <laughs> we were too close to the front. So anyhow, as time went on, uh, we uh, went on north, I remember how it happened. <laughs> Things that happened on the way, we were a maintenance outfit. We were not uh, frontline soldiers. And, uh, well, come on. We've got a little map here that they uh, brought along. And it, it shows. Oh, uh, this here. Yeah. yeah. It shows the they moved up through Italy toward Rome. Mm -hmm. and, <clears throat> and we moved on up as we moved up, as, t as uh, the front moved up, and, uh, and uh, we got to Rome. And what happened while we was in Rome? Rome was liberated. We were just sitting right outside of Rome, waiting. And what happened in Rome, there was not a fire, not a shot fired in Rome. What happened, the, the, our army and their army got together, and being it is the eternal city, we did not want to hurt, touch Rome in any way. So there was never a fire, uh, never a shot fired in Rome. It was completely intact. There was no damage to Rome. So we went right in, and first thing that we had, uh, three of us, we, there was three of us, we had our officers with us, and of course they wanted to go to see St. Peter's. So that was the first stop. We drove right up to the steps of St. Peter's in our jeeps. And the officers went in to see the inter interior of St. Peter's and the drivers, we stayed with the vehicles. Well, it didn't take long. The girls start coming around <laughs> with their bicycles. Before you know it, we were riding them on their bicycles around the square of St. Peter's. <laughs> It, they were very friendly. So we uh, moved on, and uh, we moved as the front moved. When they moved, we moved. And we never got into anything uh, dangerous in any way. So as we moved up forward through the Italy, we... Uh, well, I had it all figured out, but I can't okay. remember now. <laughs> okay. The next slide, Frank, is, is Chaplain Callahan. Why don't you, why don't oh. you start there? And... Father Callahan, oh, okay, yeah. Well, we, we did not have a chaplain when we landed. And uh, we had a Protestant chaplain with us, mm -hmm. and we had another chaplain, and, uh, but we didn't have a Catholic chaplain. So one day, Father Callahan shows up. All by himself, no assistance, no nothing. He didn't know how to drive. He didn't know how to drive or anything. So, who do you think was available? Me. I'm now. I'm father's assistant. So, of course, we had mass. We went. We had a nice portable. Uh, I think we had a picture here of it I, somewhere. I bet little. Uh, uh, well, it was a little. Uh, foldable, a little, uh, I don't know what you call it. Uh, alder, yeah, all folded up. It's nice little made out of wood, and it was nice, you know, and portable. So the, the guys in the outfit made that for us, and we carried it with us. And we went out on Sundays, maybe have two or three different services. We visit all of our companies and, and uh, take care of all the religious part of the Army. And... Uh, that's what I did with Father Callahan. But 
We kept moving forward every time as the front moved, we moved. And we got to Florence. Well, we got Florence in the fall of 44. Well, the front, usually in the winter, settles down. So we were there uh, for six months, all through the fall and the winter of 44, into 45. And the final push then came, and we went over the, into the Po Valley. But I got to go back a little ways. Yeah, I forgot. Our next uh, slide is, is. Yeah, well, that's Pisa. That's that's in Pompeii. Yeah. I mean, uh, Pisa. So, not, so now you're up here on the map. Right? Yeah, but let, let me go back again. I, I've forgotten a, f a few things. Uh, boy, I can't believe it. I had it all figured out. And we went back uh, to, uh, oh, okay, things that happened to me personally. We landed in Casablanca. So we started uh, to head uh, by, uh, on train, they call it the 40 and 8 boxcars, train. It would carry eight horses or 40 men. Well, you couldn't get 40 men in the boxcar because they had a, uh, uh, their railroad uh, uh, was not as big as ours. I forget what they call that. I can't remember now what they, they... Anyway, the trains and everything were smaller. But anyway, we went across North Africa uh, in this 40 and 8 boxcar. And uh, so the first night we was out, we stopped and we decided there was about three or four of us, five of us guys, to get some water. So we got off the train and and we're looking for water. So what happens, we get back, the train left us. It left us behind. So that's the first time I was left behind. So they called ahead anyway. The train waited for us. So the next day, another train going that way, we hopped it and we caught up with our train. So then when I was in the depot headquarters, while I was on this uh, time that uh, in the walking in the hills there, that when, they, when I got back in, of course, that was the second time I missed a call. So, third time was when we were landing at Salerno. Like I say, I was the last one out. <laughs> I got left behind again. That's the third time. So, so the fourth time I got left behind, we was in uh, Florence, and we were getting ready to move out. Well, I hadn't been on R&R. &R. All the time I was in, in the, they had R&R, &R, we'd give us a few days or a week, we'd get to roam somewhere, you know. Well, heck, I was already in Florence for six months, and the rest center was down in, in the town of Florence. So I says, so I went there, and I sat there a day or two, and then I thought, well, what the heck am I doing? I've been in Florence for six months. What am I doing here in a rest center? So I decided to go back to the outfit. They were gone. I got back to the outfit. They left me again. I got left behind again. So, I couldn't believe it. So while we went, I was, we were bivouacked with, the, with the, one of our companies, and I got there, and there was this big six-by-six six truck sitting there, all loaded, no driver. And he says to me, he says, well, why don't you take that truck up? Well, I'm not, take it up. Okay, we'll just take it up and find the outfit. So I drove it up over the hills and mountains and over into the Po Valley. And... A few days later, after I got there, I met some of the guys that the truck belonged to, the outfit. And he says to me, he says, do you know what you had in the back of your truck? I said, no, what did I have in the back of my truck? He says, you had a girl. Yes, that's what happened. I had me a girl in the back of my truck, but I didn't know what, what happened. During the six months that we were in Florence, you'd be surprised, a lot of the guys had girlfriends. They had a regular day. They come to work in the morning, and they didn't have CQ or anything at night. At home, they go to stay with their woman, you know, in a in a in an apartment, wherever they got. And the next morning, they come to work, and we had regular hours to work, you know. Being we were rear echelon, 
And uh, that's where he went in Florence. So this guy, I guess he wanted to take his woman with him, so he stuck her in this truck, and I drove it up for him. <laughs> it didn't make no difference, I mean, you know. Uh, anyhow, that was one thing that happened. And, uh, oh, God, there were some other things. Oh, okay. As we moved up one day, we came to this town. And there was a, this town set on a hill. It was like a fan, a hill. Like it was a fan, open fan, a hill. There'd been all these buildings, these houses, a little town. And approaching this town was some open country. And right in this open country was one of our tanks. American tank was sitting there. Nobody around, nobody in it, just sitting there. So, of course, you know, we drove up to it. And as we got near it, the side of the tank up on the turret, it was a hole about that big, right in the side of the tank. So we climbed up on the tank and looked down. All we seen was the ground. That tank was completely wiped out. Well, you can imagine what happened when that shell went through that tank and exploded on the inner tire. Inside of that tank, with all the munitions that the tank had, what happened to the inside of that tank? It was just cleaned right out. There was nothing left. So we went into town. And there was a tank, German tank, sitting down between. They had, in this little town, they had guns in people's houses sticking out their room, out the window, you know, towards this open ground. Small cannons. And they had this tank. He was sit sitting in between the building, pointing down there. And we got to this tank, and, and we climbed up on it. And, and well, the body, there was somebody still sitting in it. Well, he'd been in there a long time. So we, we could see here his bones right here. We got up on the tank, we looked down, his head was missing. It had fallen off. And all that was in his uniform, sitting there, still driving that tank, was a skeleton. Because they'd been there a long time. And also, we got out on the side of the road, there was another German laying there. He was down like this in his head, and he had his helmet on. It was a skeleton. They hadn't picked him up. Well, they, when they're moving fast, they don't have time to pick up the dead. So that was another thing that happened. And uh, we kept going on up, moving when we had to. And I was in being there that I was what you call by the outfit a... Uh, uh, what do you call the gopher. guy? A gopher. I was the gopher. So I was the driver. I drove. I delivered messages. We had messages. And we'd, I'd drive them up to messages. And I got to know Italy pretty good. And being I spoke the language, I didn't have any problem getting around. So this one day, I had just gone to bed about 9.30. And here comes my friend, and one of the guys in the outfit, and, and he says, get up, right? He, the lieutenant wants to see you. And I thought, we was always kidding, you know. I told him, get away from me. I got to go to bed. I'm sleeping. And he said, no, the lieutenant wants to see you. I said, oh, go on. Yeah, I thought he was kidding. So, sure enough, here comes the lieutenant, right? Get up. You got to make a run. Well, I knew Italy pretty well. Because all I did was drive. And everywhere I was, everywhere. I drove over 50,000 miles on my Jeep. And he says, well, you got to deliver, you got to make, you got to go, you got some messages here that have to be delivered. He says, here they are, go find them. They weren't, they weren't outfits that belonged to our group. They were strangers. Here's at 10 o'clock at night, he says, go find them. So I had three messages. So off I went. And just looking and asking, looking and asking. I don't know, the first out I find, I found probably was after midnight or so, but my orders were commanding officer only when you got to the outfit. Wake him up no matter what. So I did find him. Finally, I found this first outfit. I don't know, it was time, one, two o'clock in the morning. Get the commanding officer up. Yes, sir, they got him up. And he, I gave him a message. Of course, my copy was signed by him. And it was delivered, so on I went. 
had two more messages to deliver. Find them, he says. So I did find them. So finally, at three, after 3 o'clock the next afternoon, I got back to camp. Well, I'd been up all the first day. Then I was back again all the way until after 3 o'clock in the afternoon before I got back. So I don't know how many hours. I was day, two days open without, without any sleep. So I did make that message run. And that was part of my job. So then Father Callahan joined the outfit. Father Callahan, he didn't drive. <laughs> he didn't come with any assistance. So me, I'm an Italian boy. Full-blooded Italian boy. Well, of course, you're going to drive him, and I'm going to be his assistant. So I learned to be the older boy. So that's what I did for the rest of the tour. I was with Father Callahan, run messages, and did whatever had to be done around camp. I was the gopher, which was fine with me. Of course, I was trained as a combat engineer, which I never got into, which I thank everybody for that. And, well, let's see. Yeah. We're down near the end of the Po Valley on the slides. Po Valley? Yeah, there's, there's a... Oh, well, we got, yeah, we got into the Po Valley. And uh, well, I wanted to say some, something else before that. I, oh, golly, something else that happened. Things that happened uh, just, uh, anyhow. How far north? go here on, on this map that's, that's over here. Uh, what's what's uh, up here? I, I think that's Milan. As far as we got north there. Well, anyhow, oh yes. <clears throat> While we was there, you know, they the partisans I tell you in partisans, it was partisans. When the war ended, of course, they got a hold of Mussolini. In Milan, that's what had happened. Uh, we got there shortly after it happened, but the, the scaffold was still there. Is where they took Mussolini and his girlfriend and hung them up by their heels in the square and stoned them to death. They were mad at Mussolini. Of course, <laughs> Mussolini had nothing to do with it. The Germans were superior to the army of the Italians. You know, the Italians didn't want to fight. You talk to any Italian while you're over there, and they all want to go to America, you know. Everybody wanted to go to America. They loved us. And uh, that's, that's, that's how it went. Then we finally got into the Po Valley. And of course, in the Po Valley is the Italian Riviera. Well, I still hadn't gotten my R&R, &R, so I did get it then, a week on the Italian Riviera. <laughs> the Italian Riviera was reserved for the soldiers, and the French Riviera was for the officers. But we had a week there, there was no dress code, no MPs, no nothing. It, we had the town, we did whatever we wanted, and I spent a whole week there. What a week it was. Of course, we had dances there, the orchestra, we had music. And in fact, I learned to dance in, in Florence. Being there six months, we had a, we had a, we had a regular orchestra uh, ordinance band. And any time you wanted them, you were to have a dance, we'd have a dance, we'd get a room and we'd have some food. And we'd invite all the girls that put out notices that we're going to have dance and the girls would come and we had a dance. We'd dance while we were <laughs> during the war in Florence. Anyhow, that's where I learned to dance in Florence. In fact, my wife knows it. I did a little. In fact, I met her on the dance floor. This was this dance, this little dance hall there in Omaha, called the Music Box, wasn't it? And uh, every week we used to dance, go there, dance all the time. So he got. To, we were had a instruction, uh, uh, dance instructions. Uh, what? I don't know how many days a week or one day a week or something. So what we did, we, we, the, we got there early, or before the dance started, 
the girls would line up in the middle of the floor and us instructors, dance instructors, would go to the front of the line, take a girl off and wheel her around the room, you know, and show her how to try to teach her a few dancing lessons if she didn't know how to dance. So I come up to the front of the line and I picked her off the front of the line. So we're dancing, you know, well, she's dancing like a fool. And I says, well, you don't need any instructions in dancing. She says, well, it's better to get up and do something. Just sit there and not do nothing. You know, waiting for everybody dancing, having fun. And the orchestra hadn't, the dance hadn't started yet. So they just got in line just to be doing something. So I picked her up off the line. Well, I still got her. <laughs> <laughs> How many years have you been married, Frank? <laughs> well, we got married in, <laughs> in, in uh, what, what was it? Uh, Oh, God. In, in 49. We got married in June of 49. And uh, now, I, now, I'll tell you something. You know what? I married a, a teenager. She was 19 years old. I was 26. Oh. So I married me a, a teenager, which was all right. And she was a little farm girl from a, from a little farm in, out of Exira, Iowa. And uh, so she come to the big city to work. And she worked where I met her, and after I found out I met her, she worked at the Herald, at the World Herald there, the newspaper. Well, I wasn't doing anything. I was just trying to get what I could working, you know. So one day she says, well, why don't you come up and have coffee with us, with me? So I did, and uh, I got up there, and, the, and the, the coffee room was in the second floor, and right there there was a big bay window, looked right down into the press room. That's where all the big presses were at that print the paper. So I'm looking down through there, and I see a guy down there. And by golly, it was a guy who grew up and lived across the street from me. Of course, when we got older, we all went our way, you know. And I waved at him. He waved back at me. You know, his name was Ed Kopecky. So I never gave it a thought. We got married. We went to uh, uh, where we oh, we went down to San Antonio, Texas, with this another couple. We started a business. We had a fix-it shop. We specialized in repairing one-armed bandits and jute boxes and stuff like that, pinball machines. But that didn't last very long. So back we go back to Omaha, and we have a little pregnant wife. And we get back home, of course, we had, uh, I think, a suitcase with our clothes in it, in a box or something, and 20 bucks in my pocket. So, of course, we got back in... Uh, of course, my mother and father, they come on, stay with us, you know. My mother and father was, you couldn't believe. And uh, she was pregnant. So one day was at my folks' house there, and right across the street was this friend that I, tell, I just met at the scene at the, at the Herald there. And uh, he was there, come over there, and uh, when we were growing up kids, there was, was a little dry goods store there across the street this family. And uh, later on then when, uh, what do you say, what is it, when liquor come into being, oh, prohibition. prohibition come, well they, the boys grew up then and they took the little little store there that was a, uh, a dry goods store and turned it into a little bird joint. So one day was right across the street from my mother's house, we was sitting there on the porch, my wife and I, and here comes this guy that I seen there at, uh, at the Herald, and I yelled at him, and I says, Hey, Ed, I need a job. Uh, is there anything going on down there at the Herald? He says, A guy just quit. He says, A fly boy just quit. He says, I'll let you know. <laughs> Next day, he says, Come to work Monday. That's how I started in the newspaper business. I was lucky. It was the greatest job you ever wanted. What did you do exactly? Uh, we worked, Bill and I, I worked with Bill in, in Denver, we run the big newspaper. We actually did the printing of the paper. It's, it's a big block, long room full of noisy machinery. Yeah. Uh, two, pre it would, two presses would fit in this building. And we had five of them. So, wow. Uh, At the Denver Post, yeah. And it, uh, and we had, uh, that's what Bill and I did. We printed your paper. The morning paper, yeah, the day you got, the, every day you got your paper. Bill and I was part of the printing of it. So back to World War II again now. Uh, there's a, a picture of General Clark on there. We had a slide. Did you ever see the general? I seen him one time drive by. 
and he was, had his big Packard. He had two motorcycle cops in front of him, MPs, sirens are going like crazy, and down he'd go through. He was always in a hurry. It's the only time I've ever seen him. Isn't that a, but uh, hey, things weren't going all the time, just moving or everything was moving. So your map up here shows July of 1945 when you, when, when you left Italy. Can you tell us anything about that? The what? When you left Italy, when you, when you finally, when the war was over, you finally came back to the States. And yeah. When I come back, what happened after I come back to the States? No, before. How did you get back you, to the that, States? Yeah, how'd you, oh. How'd on a board ship. Okay. Talk about your ship. Oh, well, yeah. Well, well, we was coming back. Uh, well, when we went over, I went over. They What they did, they commissioned the, U, the luxury line of USS Miss America. The Army took it over and turned it into a transport. So when we went overseas, we went on the Miss America. We had 23,000 troops on this ship. It was big, the Miss America. So it usually takes two days, two and a half days to cross the ocean, you know. It took us six days. Well, what we did as we, every few minutes, they changed course. And we didn't go over in a convoy, we went all alone. So they figured that if they kept changing course every few minutes, a submarine could not get a line on us and torpedo us. That's what they figured. Anyway, we, what took six days to get across to, and landed in Casablanca. But uh, coming back, we was on a ship, a smaller ship, just an old freighter, you know, and we got into a storm. <laughs> I'll never forget that. I mean, that ship was going. It was just a small freighter. So we was laying in the bunk there and slide back and forth in your bunk. You know, it was going. And all of a sudden, the ship just rumbled. The ship just went, blah, 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 big shot. What happened was, when the propellers came out of the water, that's how much it was bobbing. The, rev, the engine would rev up, and when it did, it vibrated the whole ship. Well, where do you think you're going? Well, we, you're, you're on a ship, you know, in the middle of the ocean. We had some colored guys on board. <laughs> the first time that ship rumbled, they grabbed their mess gears, and upstairs they went. And I don't know where they were going, but they grabbed their mess. They said, well, the mother hit the mother hit her, the mother hit her, the mother hit her. <laughs> Oh, I'm telling you, they were yelling and screaming. The mother hit a, bag, hit a rock. The mother hit a rock. They thought the ship hit something. But all it was, it, the, the propellers came out and, they, and their engine revved up and it just vibrated the whole ship. They thought we hit a rock. They grabbed their mess gear up the stairs. The mother hit a rock. The mother put it hit a rock. The mother put it hit a rock, you know. And off they went. I said, I don't know where in the hell they were think they were going. We were on a ship in the middle of the ocean, you know. But anyhow, that was one thing coming back. I just went to sleep. When I woke up, everything was all over with. And we landed back at, in Newport News, Virginia. And that's where uh, uh, we also embarked from there when we went over Newport News, Virginia. So we got back and I got discharged in, uh, I don't know what it was, Fort Bragg, North Carolina or someplace. Well, they go through everything and muster you out. Well, while I was in the Army, they had a, uh, I got paid, well, we got paid a dollar a day, I think, or two dollars a day. So they had a uh, checking account set up for a savings account. So I had my money going into a savings account. So when I got discharged, I had like $800 in my, my checking account, saving account. So when they mustered us out, you got your money, you got everything, and they gave you five cents a mile to go home. So from, New from Virginia to, to long ways to Omaha, anyway, I got money for that. So I sitting there and I was thinking, well, my sister and her was married to an Air Force pilot, Air Force, Air, Air Force, man, Air Force man, and he was, he was getting discharged out of Texas, and they were heading towards Miami, Florida. Well, here I am in North Carolina. I thought, by damn it, I haven't seen him in years. So down I went to Miami. I stayed down there for a week with them. Then I'm coming back up, and I got to, to, uh, to Washington, D.C., and I thought, 
Well, heck, my friend that I in Army with Nick, he, he lives in Brooklyn. So I got me a round trip ticket to Brooklyn and back. So I went to Brooklyn and stayed with him for a week. So it took me two weeks to get home after I got discharged. So I comes out of the train. I walks up to the train depot in Omaha. Who do you think's waiting there for me? My mother, my father, and my sister. They didn't know when I was coming, but what they'd do, they'd go down there and sit all day waiting. As the people, a lot of, you should have seen a lot of old mamas, you know, they, they'd all sit in there, and when people get out of the train as they walk through the, the terminal, they'd all get up and look. I guess they're looking for their son or whoever it was. It, it, it was, it was anyhow. My mother and father was there too, waiting. And that's the way I got home. And uh, here I am. So we, uh, I guess we got married. Why, why don't we open it up for questions? Wait, what's that, Mom? We've got a question for Frank. Oh. Well, Thank we'll you, Mr. Holmes. Places you went with Father Callahan. Oh, well, we went off the really. Oh yes, uh, we uh, we uh, while we were in uh, in Ro in Rome there, uh, the Germans uh, there was a, about twelve Germans every day they went through German through Rome, and they were very uh, exact. The German time and everything was always there. So the the I tell you they're there they somebody. You know, they had these little push cars go over there to sweep the streets, you know, back then. So it was sitting on the side of the road, and here comes this German troop, about a dozen guys. Every day they went by this little place. Well, what happened, they did. They put explosives in this little push cart, this broom cart that the street sweeper used to use. And as the soldiers went by, they exploded it, and they killed about four of the Germans. Well, so what did they do? They went and got about ten hostages for every German that they killed. They put them in this cave, people, and they machine gunned them all. And then they blew the top of the cave down on top of them. Well, it just so happened while we were there in Rome and with Father Callahan, we heard about this and we got to the cave and they were there digging the cave out, the, the civilians, and uh, the people that they uncovered, they had them in little coffins sitting all on the ground there, you know. So that was one thing we got into there and saw that, which wasn't very nice. And, uh, but uh, I don't know. It, it, it was something to see, and I was very lucky. From a combat engineer to an older boy is the way I ended up. <laughs> but somebody had to do it, do it. I was selected, and I did it. I did what I was supposed to do, and I made it. And that was our story. And then I, oh, uh, trying to think. Anything else happened? Or really, nothing. Oh, one time, oh yes. One time we were moving up. So our fierce leaders was in front, driving our convoy, little convoy. We were driving along, and all of a sudden, oh, wah, 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 wah. we're hearing things going over our head, you know. It was artillery shells. Well, we're looking around, we could see where the artillery shells were landing, you know. Well, whose artillery shells are those? Well, there are artillery shells. We had moved up ahead of our artillery. So here we were in no man's land <laughs> between the front line and our artillery. You could, the about face, we went like crazy right back where, where we were supposed to be in the rear, you know. But that's, that's one, another thing that happened to us. It, Take the jeep and go where? Oh, yes. When, well, when Mount Vesuvius was going, the uh, we had uh, officers there, and they wanted to go to uh, the Isle, uh, Isle of Capri, which was just north of of Nap south of Naples. So here, this Mount Vesuvius was erupting. Well, Mount Vesuvius, a lot of ash was coming out. Of course, ash is what it is. It's, it's, it's rock, molded rock, that real fine particles like sand. And of course, they was, they was blowing south. And that's what happened many, many years ago, how Pompeii was buried. 
by Mount Vesuvius many, many years ago. It was actually, the town was buried with, with the ash from the volcano. So the story goes that they were building a road and finally they, they run into Pompeii and they uncovered it. And we were, we were, my wife and I, we, well, on our 25th one anniversary, I told my wife, I says, come on, I'm going to take you to Italy. So we went with the German club out of Boulder and we went on a charter flight. We ended, we landed in Frankfurt, Germany. We got off the plane and the gal says, Goodbye, we'll see you in five weeks. You're on your own. So, what did we do? We had to do, we rented a car. So off we went. We drove Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and dropped down into Italy. We drove the whole length of Italy down and back again. That was our first trip. We went to Italy. And on our 25th wedding anniversary. The second time we went, my young brother and his wife, I says, well, we're talking about him, talking this and that. Well, he decided, well, hey, let's go to Italy. I said, okay, we'll go again. So me, my brother, and his wife, the four of us, we went uh, uh, by flight, and we landed in Rome. No, so same thing, we rented a car. So off we go. We went up all the way up to Pisa. I've been up to the, on the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa twice. Now, the third time we was there with my brother, the Leaning Tower of Pisa started to lean a little bit more. So they had it all fenced off. We couldn't go up to the top of it. So they had to reinforce it so it quit leaning some more. But actually, it leaned. <laughs> and you went, when you went in it, you went round and round, up, down, up, all the way around to the top. And uh, that was one, one thing we did. And uh, we drove all through Italy. Oh, we got uh, we we got hijacked, didn't we? Yes. We got hijacked in Italy. One day we were driving, and oh, this was the second time when my brother was with us. And uh, the guys were behind us in the car, tooting our horn, you know, tooting our horn. They're pointing, you know, like, well, something's wrong. So we stopped. Well, they says, yeah, we think you have a low, you got a low tire. So we looked around, and there was nothing wrong with our tire. So we got back in the car. While we got back in the car, they jammed and, and punched our tire. So we started driving. Sure enough, we had a flat tire then. So we stopped, and they kept us busy. And while they talking to us, they went through our car, and they stole a lot of stuff out of our car. They actually, that's the way they did it. While they kept us busy, the guys went through our car where well, they took my brother's camera, her purse, and all that stuff, and off. And we got, they left, and we got back in the car, and all stuff was all gone. Monte Cassino, how far away were you when they were bombing you? Monte Cassino? Oh. Oh, that story, okay. Well, they were getting ready to mount, to, to see. We have the map showing the picture. Monte Cassino. You ever been up the Lariat Trail here? You know that in Boulder, in Boulder, the Lariat Trail, where the where you go up this uh, top and on top, this is the is a uh, 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 is a cemetery, a military cemetery up there. You ever been anybody up there? Well, yeah, well, Bill Hitchcock is buried up there, just out of right near Boulder, and uh, every, the the trail goes round and round. Well, this we got there to this. Uh, uh, monastery that was bombed uh it was to remind us of the lariat trail here anyhow what happened this day we were there and our commanding officer i don't know how he knew it he says well anyhow first let me let me start the monastery was up on a hill looking right down on the main road well that was the only road that went up through that area there through italy it was the main road is the only road we had and we couldn't move because they had observers up in the church. And every time our unit started to move, their artillery was pinned, pointed right on the road. And we couldn't move. Well, we had to get those observers up there on the church, get them out of there. So what happened one day, our commanding officer, he found out the day they were going to bomb the monastery where these guys were up there. So he decided, who wants to go watch the bombing of the monastery? 
I said, no, I don't think I want to go. Anyway, the three or four other guys got in a jeep and they went up there. When it was all over with, planes, boy, hundreds of planes come over and they just bombed the living hell out of it so they'd get those damn Germans out of there because they was observing up there. So when they got back, this old my one guy, his name was Murphy. Man, he was white as a sheet. He says that lousy mother drove us so damn close. The bombs were coming down. They had to jump out of their Jeep and hit the dishes. They almost got killed by our own bombs. That's, that, and I said, that's why I didn't want to go. <laughs> it was something. Uh, there's things happen, happen. But anyhow, we got into the Po Valley. And uh, that's when the war ended. I think I had a date here somewhere. Well, do we have any other final questions? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, oh. More than a year ago, we had a, there was a guest here, Uwe, uh, mm -hmm. who is um, a, a native German speaker, and he spent time in uh, Germany mm -hmm. following the war. Yeah. Now, being an Italian speaker, were your services, I mean, could you have stayed in Italy following? Um, June of 1945 and served as an interpreter or a liaison? No, no. Any sort? No, no. We, the war ended and we immediately got ready to come home. Yeah. Was that because Italy was so relatively peaceful? I yeah. Guess, or just, you just weren't needed? No, we're, no, the war was ended. The war ended while we were in the Po Valley. When we come into the Po Valley, the war ended on uh, February the 28th, I guess, of 45. And that's when the war ended, and I had it written down here. I don't know what happened to my, anyhow. Uh, uh, the big difference yeah, is that uh, Germany was occupied, and Italy well, yeah. was not that much. Right, yeah, that's... Yeah, they, uh, 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 no, as soon as the war ended, everything immediately, we start uh, getting everybody home as fast as they could. But uh, that's what happened. Uh, it, it, it was an experience, and I was very lucky. From, a, like I say, from a combat engineer. Did we have someone here who was a combat engineer? <laughs> no, we have this right here, this man yes, here was a. He, he trained at Fort Belvoir. Yes, sir. The yeah. same place I did. Still there. But did you did you actually serve as a combat engineer? Yes. Where at? In uh, Vietnam and also in Germany. Oh, that was later after. Yeah, yes. after. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, uh, but like I say, <laughs> from a combat engineer, I ended up as an older boy. <laughs> I was, like I say, I was the gopher of the outfit. And uh, the, the, the office, I mean, there was, we were office. I mean, they were all, uh, the pencil pushers were all occupied. They didn't need me for there, but I was the runaround, and I enjoyed every bit of it. I seen it like nobody else did. And I we back, back twice, and we knew where we were going, and we seen all the sights of, oh, while I was over there one, one day, and we have Catholics here, I think, when we was in Florence, on certain day of St. Peter's and Paul's Day, they opened up a museum. This museum was a painting of the Last Supper, the original painting of the Last Supper that was painted by uh, Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci. Very, and 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 I got to see it on certain days. They'd open up this this room. It was in the it was the original painting of the Last Supper, in Florence. Florence was quite a place. Well, Frank, uh, we'll, we'll we'd, we'd invite all of you to stick around here and also visit with uh, Frank some more. But we'd like to thank you and give you one of our oh. uh, challenge coins for the museum. Thank and you. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your story. So, You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I uh, did what I had to do. And I'm very happy about it. Well, Frank, you did pretty Thank good you. for a 93-year-old yeah. yes. guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 93 years old. I <laughs> had a little trouble remembering, but uh, it was an experience, and I had to do it, and I was chosen to do it, and I did it, what I had to do. Well, thank you so much. You're all welcome. So again.